Welcome to Horror Movies with TNA. Each episode, we're going to pick a film, talk about it, and rate it. Word of warning, there will be spoilers. This week, we're talking about... Hello? Yeah? Uh, bells. We're not sure. Sometime in the 80s, we think. Early 80s. Director Michael Anderson and uh, Richard Chamberlain. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Tagline, pierce your brain, explode your heart. No, not arse heart. What do we think of the film? Pierce your brain. What a twat. You know, I'll well, see I... you on the flip side or something. I am Adam Roberts. Still not very loud. Really, really good. Really good stuff. Yeah, when was nice. the last time I revose for anything? Oh. Ah, dibba, dibba. You don't. You can imagine, can't you? Does that make it louder? Well, you're just shouting louder each time you say. Does that, that make it louder? <laughs> that's louder. Well, yeah, but that's because you shouted. Yeah, every time I shout loud, it makes it louder. Yeah, funny that. <laughs> Do you think you are? In this episode, I've got a little <laughs> task for you. Have a think of your favourite horror movie title. You can throw any ideas you want in, do a top five, but ultimately you've got to name your favourite. I'll leave you to cogitate that and we'll return to it at the end. What do you think about that? It's a new section. <laughs> All right. Um, are you doing your usual... Preamble. Bullshit. Yeah, no, Preamble. I'm going to. Naming the best movie title is quite relevant because the film we're doing today has got one of the fucking worst film titles ever. And it is 1982. Oh, I it's quite I'm good. talking now. 1982, Bells, a.k.a. Murder by Phone and The Calling as well. Oh, I didn't know that it was called The Calling. Yes. Well, I don't think Bells does much, but we'll come back to that. It's mentioned a lot in the film. What? The ringing of the bells? Yeah, bells are one kind of another, yeah. It's, oh yeah it's shit it's shit nay uh, the tagline though had me losing my shit it said your phone can pierce your brain explode your heart and jolt you ten feet it promised yeah okay. it really does one of those things doesn't it, it? it ten feet yeah unless it's firing you out of an office block yeah. and then it's ten feet horizontal <laughs> and <laughs> 400 feet 20 stories yeah. down yeah. we'll get to that we will Bells, 1982, directed by Michael Anderson. Quite. 82? Probably. I've got... I Have you got I've 81? Got 81, I think. Yeah. yeah, I saw it. There was a mixture. And in their on film, that. on their phone conversation, they're going about someone uh, in 1978. And that was two years ago, he says, on the phone. So it's filmed in So it's 1980. 1980. Oh, it's oh, a mystery in itself. Oh. Um, Michael Anderson, yeah, so... Quite renowned director, yeah. Orca, Logan's Run. Uh, he's, he's credited with about 40 films. Yeah, yeah. but his most famous one, The Dam Busters. I'm not bothered about that. Hey, um, well, I, 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 was more, I, I was more about Werewolf Woman. Did he, he didn't do Werewolf Woman. That's, that was in his list. Don't look, don't well, argue with me. Spanish director. No, it, must be, film, different, it must be a different from Werewolf Woman. Oh, okay. There's more than one Werewolf Woman. Oh, yeah, there, there was shit loads. But yeah, I pulled out uh, Logan's Run because I quite like that. Uh, starring, a bit of housekeeping, so starring Richard Chamberlain as Nat Bridges. I'm not going to talk about, he's done loads of stuff, isn't he? He was a Hollywood heavyweight at the time. He was, he was in Shogun. Yes, he was in Shogun. He was in loads of stuff around the 80s and 90s. So Taylor Ridley, the love interest in the film, that's Sarah Botsford. Tremors 4 she was in, and Deadly Eyes, and then a whole list of other things. She went on, didn't she? He's RT. He keeps referring to the one he's... I, I think I think he refers to as arty because she's an artist. Oh, I think that's it. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh. We've also got Stanley Markowitz, um, played by John Houseman. And of course, he was in The Fog. At the beginning, yes. Yes, not much, but he was in The Fog. Yeah. So that's I'm the one. Think what else? He was also in. in Ghost Story with Fred Astaire. <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing because there's a famous bit with like where a penis. Na- <laughs> yeah, where a naked man falls out of a window. <laughs> yes, so John Houseman, famous Spivey Point. That's it. We've got Gary Reinecker as Lieutenant Mira as well. He was in the film Rituals, which I only mentioned because we were going to review that at some point. Yeah, you but watched it on my behalf and said it's not. Well, no, the quality of the film, it was. Well, I think we might revisit it at some point, but a lot of the films really dark. The copy I had, so. 
Uh, yeah, so that's um, Gary Reinecker as the cop, Lieutenant yeah. Mira. And then we've got also Fred Waits, who's the telephone company president. And that's played by Barry Morse of Space 1999. Yeah. He was in The Changeling and the 1972 film Asylum. Uh, again, lots of other films, but He's those are the ones. Though, isn't he? Um, oh, he was in Space 1999. When I was watching the film, I didn't really notice who was American and who was British. I, 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 know, I, was just, I was just... Yeah, but he, he might have been, yeah. I yeah, was wondering, because it's a Canadian film, isn't it? I would go look at the title. Cana- yeah, yeah, Canadian-American, it said. Kind of Canadian slash American. Primarily Canadian, it's, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's very TV movie-ish, really. An ex-student of Nat Bridges, who's an environmentalist and science teacher, has a heart attack, but Nat Bridges... He's not buying that for one second. No, he, he gets quite angry for, for no apparent reason a few times as well. Subway. A young woman helps a gentleman who's been knocked over by some hoodlums. Payphone starts to ring and once she's helped him to his feet, she returns to answer the phone. And there's no answer. And then... Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> Is that accurate? What? What's that? That's the noise. Is this a, are you reading the novelisation of... Uh, yes. Bells. <laughs> yes. Right. Everything shakes. Her eyes bleed. There's a crack of lightning. I mean, you can describe it as well afterwards. And it blows her off her feet yeah. onto well, the escalator and she travels. I mean, you're escalator. making it sound so much better than it actually is. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, no, well, well, that's what I'm here to do. Not, to honest, that's what I'm here to do. <laughs> I mean, the trouble is, in a way, it's not, it's not that bad, especially the first time. But there is a law of diminishing returns on this. And so Bells begins. Crack of lightning. Uh, the only witness at this point is a bag lady. And we meet her again later. And it then shows uh, just a, a bit of the handset burning and melting. And yeah. that's kind of the beginning. And then up pop the credits. Bright red. Murder by phone. In the version I watched. Oh, it was actually it was murder by Bells. Yeah. Well, I mean... I ended up watching about three different versions at different well, points. Well, you told me to watch the yeah. ten and, minute longer version. And I think I ended up watching that one as yeah. well, yeah. But uh, yeah, she's on a vibration plate at one point. You know, when you if you've ever been to a gym and you're meant to have to stand on these plates that help your muscles. Yes. That's what it looks like she's on. The, 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 like I say, the first two murders and there's quite a few murders, but they're all a variation on well, on not, not much of a variation on a thing. They're all the same well, kind of it, depth. It then, the first scene we've got is where it introduces Nat Bridger. When it first introduces him, I thought it was he was it hung himself because it has like a desk and then it just has his feet oh, yeah. on the chair. I thought we were going to see some kind of... Um, uh, so, but anyway, it's not that. Environmentalist and teacher, Nat Bridger. It, what does he teach exactly? I, I think he teaches science. I don't know how it all comes together that he's an environmentalist and science teacher. Well, anyway, yeah, like to be. straight away we get a feel for the kind of guy he is. Because they're trying to get him to go to a meeting and he says, tell him I can't attend his crappy meeting. There's a major grant that hinges on me turning up for this conference. He's a loose cannon. He's a maverick. He's a free thinker. He's a fucking... But the bit of dialogue, he goes, this is interesting. He goes, 12.20, the bell rings, I'm out of here. Meaning, you know, he's going home or... Dead. Oh, it's <laughs> ominous. You know, that's like an omen for the rest of the film. The bell rings, I'm out of here. I think as a lead character, he's, a f- he's fucking as unlikable as I've ever seen a lead character. The, the, I, I agree, but the, di- the dialogue is not just... It's not necessarily shit dialogue. It's just fucking surreal, some of it. Yeah, it doesn't... It's like no, no one talks ever... In the entire no, life. even back in the eighties, nobody talked like that. No, nobody said. It's ever. like someone says something, and then someone says something else. There's no replying to a conversation. <laughs> Nat Bridger, Bridger, he inspires the class. He even writes an equation on the board: power over technology equals control of destiny. I don't know what math that is. It's no math I've hey, ever heard of. He's thinking of the big picture. Well, I wrote underneath: bad script over dodgy acting equals bells. Yeah. I'm not, well, I don't, I, I, don't, just say no. I don't know whether it's a bad script. It's just a fucking weird one. Maybe it was a good script and then they... Well, that's the other thing. Four people wrote the story and I don't know whether it, I couldn't, I couldn't, it was that bad, <laughs> the version. Of, it's four people wrote the story and four people wrote the script. So whether they went into, that might be why it's different bits of dialogue don't seem to connect with each other. Yeah, maybe they just met together right at the end. 
Well, he goes, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll write for this bloke, you write for the woman, <laughs> and then just see what happens. Nat goes out to visit the parents of the young woman who we saw die at the beginning, because we learn that she is a student. an ex-student. Sandra, who's an ex-student of his. So he goes out to visit the parents who are understandably still coming to terms with the loss of the daughter. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's an unusual thing to do, but I suppose it's just... How do you connect him to start getting involved with this random woman that you saw? In the she was way? his best student. Um, maybe just, he was. Police officer could have just rang him up. Maybe really. he um, loved her. Well, that's a little. He is a bit of a prick, like you say. So yes. Maybe. Or uh, heart that attack. That's the report. Nineteen years old. Heart attack. Something Can doesn't happen. add up. When he's at this conference, he's down in that area, so he agrees to do some digging around. And to pick up Sandra's possessions. What does he do with the fucking possessions? I'm, I'm... It's a, it's a, a suitcase, and he digs around in it. Sniffs well, the undergarments. Well, after he's had the, the weirdest conversation ever again with this police <laughs> officer. Death number two. Straight away, we're into oh, death yeah, yeah, number yeah. two. Now, interestingly, guy working late, Gordon Smith, and answers the phone. A voice. You stole it from me, Gordon. It should have been mine. Boo, 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 boo. Crunches down on the pencil, the HB pencil oh, yeah, he's got in his, his mouth. Because yeah. he's shaking that violently. Then both him and his office chair are fro- I don't know how this works. Are thrown through the uh, office block I window. I tried to draw it, but I mean... It's, You've got, I've well, got the is, angle. It's like an angled window. Um, I thought it was quite good because I thought, oh, he's he, he just buying his pencil. His eyes are bleeding like the last woman. And he's wibbling about a little bit, not on the vibration plate like the last one was. Flash your light. And then thought, what's he going to do now? Is he going to fly off? Because it, it took a while, didn't it? And then next thing you know, yeah, a big flash of light. And, and his wheelie chair goes right out the window. No, wheelie chair. It's, it's, it's his office chair. It's not a wheelie chair. Wheelie chair. Oh, wheelie wheelie chair. chair. Wheelie chair. He's about fucking 30 feet from the window, actually. It's a massive office. Oh, yeah. And then he falls. Well, it's more than 10 and, feet. False and, advertising. Okay, all right. And then he falls, um, plop down yeah, on the car. Good. I didn't expect they were going to show that <laughs> yeah. bit as well. Well, I mean, it's from a very, it's from a distance. Yeah. Well, it's better that because I was thinking, don't, sh- don't show the dummy well, in the fucking well, they were never car. Um, so he, he that, goes dink it? down onto a car. He, the phone also, the handset also uh, glows blue at one point. Oh yeah, this as is the first bit of visual effects. He goes a bit power. pink. He goes a bit pink, doesn't he? <laughs> he does. Do I really, really recognised him as an actor, but I, I couldn't find who he was, and I really recognised him. I but didn't, throw it I open. Did if not. anybody knows, uh, let me know. I didn't. Bells, Gordon Smith. If anybody knows. Um, where the fuck were we? Right, where we were is at the conference, and we get introduced to. Interestingly, on the version I watched, there's loads of, bit, of bits cut out where it introduces uh, Stanley Markowitz, his mentor, associate, friend. The, the version on YouTube that says it's uncaught is 10 yeah. minutes shorter than the other version. and Unless there's more gory bits of the murders. Or... I don't think there's any gory bits. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so it, it briefly introduces Stanley and we have conversations between Nat and Stanley. Then Nat and the local cop clashes because the cops are just not interested. In it. But it's then that Nat learns that there was a witness, the, you know, the bag lady... Uh, at one point, Nat says to him, your style doesn't impress me. In fact, it sucks. So they stru- they've struck up a mutual dislike of each other, although yeah. initially they come together towards the end. But again, it's a weird conversation because it's so... I don't know whether it's trying to cram subjects in there and as a result, the, to... the conversations are quite stilted, I think. Yeah, I think it, it's trying to sound cleverer. Yes, it is I, think it's trying, I think it's trying to have a message and it should have just not fucking bothered. Actually, we switch to a scene now where there's there's some build up um, for each murder now from now on, where it tries to explain why people have got on the wrong side of the murderer. Because we have a scene now where it's from the point of view of the killer, and he visits the municipal tax office, and the lady at the desk is quite rude to him, yeah. and as a result of that, she's Mrs. Anderson. She's sealed her fate because she's quite rude. Uh, Nat's gone to the subway to investigate the scene of Sandra's death, and he questions the bag lady. She's foreign. Because she says, when he questions her about what happened, she says... Are you going to have a go? She on phone, gone by lightning. She keeps saying that. That's no, that. word for word, she says, she on phone, gone by lightning. Yeah, but... Oh, all right, go on then. When Nat looks at the handset, 
he realises that the handset's a brand new one. It's a clean, brand new handset, so it's obviously been replaced. Again, his suspicions are aroused. Then we switch to murder number three, back to Mrs Anderson, the lady from the tax office. She, she picks up the phone and the voice on the other end of the phone says, Mrs Anderson, first of all, is there anyone else on the phone? It turns out her son's listening on the other yeah, phone. Yeah, you see the kid in the background. This is a bit, yes. I mean, obviously the guy now is a clever guy, so maybe he can tell when there's someone else is on the phone. And he's thinking, I don't want to kill a random, but I just want to kill you. And it's her son. Yeah. Now, I said it would have been better if the phone had taken them both out because he was on roller skates as well. So I thought if it had <laughs> thrown him 10 feet, he'd have been flying along for <laughs> half an hour. Yeah. That would have been great. Yeah, but it didn't anyway. But this but this murder wasn't too bad, actually. Beep, beep, boop, 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 boop. Well, this is, so she's doing it again, doing a wobbling on a vibration plate. Yes. Kids in the background. He's got massive headphones and... Um, well, he's got some cans on, yes, so he can't hear what's happening to his mum. He's distracted, yes. and uh, yeah, his mum gets normal thing. She well, gets thrown through a glass cabinet, actually, doesn't she? She does, but what she does is throw the phone away from her into the washing up bowl that she was at, and then that all blows up in front of her, so it's a bit more... Uh, Explosive. Uh, less shit. Foamy liquid everywhere. Oh, Christ. Uh, and then she gets thrown against a cabinet, like you say. <laughs> this is about 20 minutes in, so we've already had three kills. I did write here, though, at, at one point, and I suppose I'll come back to this later. The scenes in between the kills are very boring, because we, we switch back to Nat, who's taking a visit to the phone company uh, to do more investigating. It's an impressive place. Powerful company. Big tower bot building. Yeah, Interworld Telephone. In, I think it was called Interworld Telephone. Okay. I think so. This is where we're introduced to Ridley, the love interest. And Nat continues to be an utter gonk. She's painting a mural on the wall. She asks him, do you like it? And he says, it's not right. What a twat. But the conversation he has just before them with the person... That Receptionist, says, yeah. Yeah, I, I think At I've read desk. something down here. Uh, oh no, yeah, I just said, dot, 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 bad dialogue. He basically, okay. I mean, he's trying to do a bit of digging around and he's getting nowhere because it's almost like the phone company's shut up shop. It won't tell him anything, um, which arouses his suspicion even more. But it does give him an idea at that point while he's there that he could hitch a ride on one of the guided tours. Yeah. And again, that's an important bit, but it comes around later. So he could do some snooping around later on. Imagine how great that tour would be as well around a phone company. Well, you see some of it later on. You see some of it later on. Yeah, so he's walking out of the building and who does, should he see? Where Because he gets nowhere trying to do his investigation. But that uh, lady... Rid Ridley? Okay. Ridley um, or RT, as I'm calling her. She she seems to like that, but that must be because she's a fucking idiot if she does. But anyway, well, it didn't yes. take much persuasion because he just goes, uh, uh, dinner, no PM? She goes, yeah, all right. This does follow a lot of him just trying to kind of get the story. So he goes back down to the subway and he phones them up and reports that one of the handsets has been taken, primarily to get a technician down there so he can question it. Yeah, because he's after the he does have a conversation. He says, "Can I speak? Can I get the repairman's name?" So he ends up cutting the cable <laughs> sneakily as it in and a he paper. Steals the handset and dumps it. And then he waits until the repairman gets there and has a great conversation well, with him. No, however, however. Interspersed in there, we have oh, the yeah. we have the setup for murder four again. Back in the point of view of the murderer, <laughs> it shows <laughs> it shows him trying to get into the first intercity bank. I think it's he's frustrated because it keeps showing that it's not quite closing time yet, but they've closed, so he can't get through it, the door. It was utter bollocks, isn't <laughs> it? but he can see that the bank staff having are having some kind of party. Well, it's, it's the managers having a party. party. Which is fantastic. So we're seeing this through the killer's eyes again. And he's obviously very frustrated. And the bank teller comes to the door that he's trying to get through and tells him to come back tomorrow. You're dead, bank teller, essentially. So for some reason, she's going to die just because she's the one yeah, that said, come back later. it was probably the bloke. Because there's a bloke in the background. That's the bank manager. Being fed cake by the... the yeah, he's lady. got a party hat on. And they're obviously... Oh, just there's another important bit, bit. And I can't remember whether it was... Uh, this on the first point of view ch -ch 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 bit or this one or both 
He has an umbrella. Yes. He's kind of, he's, he emphasises it quite a lot. He's looking down, he's got an umbrella. He's a bank manager. Or he po- pokes it. No, the, the, the point of view bloke's got an oh, umbrella. Oh, sorry, yes, yes. The killer's got an umbrella, yeah. hasn't he? And I couldn't fucking work out what the fucking point of that was. But then I worked it out later on. In case it rains. Right, back to the subway. Nap questions the technician. Technician says, some turkey must have taken a flamethrower to the receiver. Nat says, could it have been the voltage electromagnetic transducer? And the technician says, are you some kind of phone freak? It looks like it had a flamethrower. Oh, he makes the noise of a yeah. flamethrower. Well, that was what I just did that. Yeah, he makes, no, he makes the noise of a flamethrower. I'm doing the movement. You well. didn't. You're just <laughs> playing. Got... No, that's worse, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Anyway, flamethrower. The key part of this exchange is that Nat learns that this has happened on previous occasions. This has happened a few times. So this isn't a one-off. Again, Nat suspects there's more to this story. He's an environmentalist. He's a science teacher. He's a gym teacher. Yeah. He's a phone freak. But, you know, it does make a big point of him being an, uh, an eco-warrior environment. But really... What did I say it was at the beginning? It, it, I said, he's a... Listen, because I said... He's a maverick. He's a loose cannon. He's a free thinker. He's everything. He's a bit of a prick. <laughs> but the eco warrior, I thought I was going to elaborate. Maybe it's something to do with that. Because, uh, I mean, I'm not going to skip to the end, but there's something about environmentalism mentioned, but not elaborated on at all. <laughs> it's like you didn't do your job. And you go, well, f-. but we'll get to that because it's fucking boring. Murder number four. The bank manager drops Connie, the bank teller, oh. off at her home. The phone's already ringing before she's even got in her apartment. It's already ringing. You can hear it ringing. As she's walking up to her apartment, she picks up the receiver. You don't know what it's like to be kept waiting. Well, she just punts about a bit. She runs to the phone, picks it up and goes, hang on a second. Strips off. Strips off and goes back to the door, strips off, just... <laughs> Well, not much strip. Yeah, off. and I thought, she's keeping him waiting again. She's answered the that's, phone. That's she says, right. hang on again. It works on so many yeah. levels. She just strips off to like a, uh, I don't know what you call them. It's a like petticoat a... petticoat kind of shit. Uh, beep, 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 beep. So, beep, 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 beep. Shaking, shaking, shaking. And she's looking in a mirror this time. For so- oh, you see her reflection. Oh, yeah. And actually, it's worth saying, and with each murder, we see more and more of the... Buttons and dials, as he or she continues to fry each victim, Definitely. you see a little bit each time. She could have big hairy man hands. Big hairy man hands. Great, that's a great song. Oh, that was that the thing she dies next to? It's a Mickey Mouse. Oh, it is a Mickey Mouse. It's a phone. Mickey Mouse phone that's sprayed with her blood. To be honest, this is the least good. That's such bad English. It's Shittiest, the worst. Yeah, it's least the, good is the worst, isn't yeah, it? It's. Not very good, this murder particularly. But this one, yeah, you get to see the least amount. I thought, I mean, this is dead pervy, I guess. Cut this out. What, you thought her clothes, clothes would just fall, fall off? <laughs> Fly off. <laughs> Ten feet. Yeah. Ten She'd feet. still be there, frazzled. She ends up a bit bloodless for saying all this blood splattered on the Mickey Mouse. Yeah, Santa. she's not overly covered in blood, is she? And she just, <laughs> she ends up falling next to... Like a big furry teddy. Oh, well, I thought it was Pink Panther at first, but it's not, is it? It's yeah, like it's a, big a big pink teddy. teddy, yes. So she just ends up, resides there, uh, looking uh, like she's having a rest. Yeah, murdered on before. Ridley, so Artie, and Nat, um, she suggests that she can get him on one of the uh, tours at the phone place. Actually, we start to learn as well now that Nat is being followed by a, gu- yeah, by a guy. Because they're on the date, aren't they? Yes. Uh, and there's a guy that's been, we later learn, has been hired by the phone company to um, follow him and take photos of him. Their date generally is got, it's very, very philosophical talk. There's one bit where he goes, do you look at a spider's web? Do you see the morning dew on spider's web or do you just see it as a series of geometric shapes? Yeah. It's deep. And dull. Yeah, but in this is a bit. In reply, she doesn't answer that fucking tall. She says something about, I don't know. But it, she doesn't answer that. She doesn't say, well, you know. She just goes she kind of says, I, I, I don't think about it. <laughs> well, fucking hell. They're both 
Uh, it just, it's a very strange, and this is a first date. We move on from that scene. Turns out that Stanley, Nat's friend, is actually the phone company's environmental consultant. If, you know. I don't know why they need that for phone company, it, but. We immediately suspect he's not to be trusted. And Nat convinces, and then we've got a conversation with Nat convincing Sergeant Nera to help him. He's seen the evidence piling up, so now the cops yeah, are starting to, to come round to his way of thinking for some reason. For some reason, a woman who's been commissioned to paint a mural at the phone company has been given access to lots of plans of the building, which she supplies him, Nat, with that information. Of yeah, where and the lab is. I'm not as sure well. why she would be given all that information if all RT is doing is painting a picture on a wall. Doesn't get explained. Then he confronts yeah. the person who's following him and pins into a lamppost or... In a very busy street where you yeah. can see people in the background aren't really actors. Yeah, they're, they're not part of the film. No, they're just <laughs> looking going, what the fuck is Richard Chamberlain beating up this photographer? <laughs> We're on the tour. Nat's on the tour. Actually, some interesting information. The, the tour guide says this on the tour when he's leading people around. By the year 2000, oh, yeah. 1.4 trillion phones will be in the world. Yeah, it's probably underestimated that, maybe. I, I, had a, I searched on, uh, on oh, Google and, how many is and it? it said there was, it was in the billions, not trillions. Oh, so he's talking it's, shit. But, I mean, look, yeah, Don't very remember, informative. Well, ah, but maybe he was on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, absolutely. 50 minutes in, Nat slopes off and finds some more of these damaged handsets as proof. Damaged. Damaged handsets. Yes, I've called uh, melted phones an art installation. That was in sub-basement A360 they were in. He blags his way in there. Oh, yeah, he blags his way in there past the security guard by saying this. Uh, oh, shoot. I left a whole slew of calculations in there. The security... Then discover him snooping around and they lock the place down. And Nat ends up escaping okay, disguised yeah. as a workman. It's yeah. like James Bond. Yeah, but the way, <laughs> the, when he comes strutting out, he's got like his fingers in it. He's got one of a very tight... T- I can't say. It, he, he very looks tight like, t-shirt um, on. Yeah, village people. He looks like the, gay of a, yeah, the gayest member of the village people. Yeah, he's got his helmet out and he's walking, striding out, pleased with himself. All right. We switched to Ridley's apartment, and the one thing I will say is that Ridley's phone, because the phones are the major part of the film, looks like a sex toy. Doesn't oh it? yeah, I've got it's very uh, phallic. Yes, knob phone, as I've called it. Yes, a she's got a knob phone. Yes. We start to learn more and more that Stanley, Nat's friend, is being paid by the phone company. He already knows all about this. He's being paid to cover it up and hide the story. Stanley's working for them and he holds out on that. But then we switch to murder number five, which unfortunately is Stanley's death. Dr. Markowitz, you had your chance to control your environment. Now I've found a way of controlling mine. Boop, beep, ba, beep, beep, ba, beep, 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 uh, Fred, Fred Dibner. Fred Dinage. He looks like Dinage. Fred Dinage on the yeah. cover. No one's going to know who the fuck that is, <laughs> even in the UK. <laughs> you were talking about the build-up to his death. Oh, yeah. Murder number five. <laughs> I still don't That's not on me so I can't I, I just think he... Anyway, he gets killed, and he's got a big pair of glasses on, hasn't he? And they get cracked. So at least he's doing something different. So as he's doing it, he's going... Whoop, 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 whoop. That, That's that is, losing. right, listen, that is where it says, on that poster, it can pierce your brain. I'll go back to this, see if you agree. It pierces your brain, it explodes your heart, and it jolts you ten feet. Well, Poor it, old Stanbop. They spray a bit of raspberry ripple on him, and then throw him through uh, some patio windows, don't they? Dead. Well, it's definitely not it. Dead. Yeah. Yeah, he's, so, quite, he's thrown through quite violently, which isn't John... Which definitely is John Aspen. Act- no, because he'd be dead. Literally, yes. would be dead if they did that to him. Nat's informed of Stanley's death. Obviously, he's quite upset because I don't think he knows the Maybe. extent of Stanley's involvement with the phone company. No, but he doesn't seem that bothered. The- really. Sergeant Mira says, "Lightning, goddamn lightning!" 
The cops are now hell-bent on catching the killer, along with Nat. So they're both in it together. So Nat and Mira pay the phone company president, Fred Waits, a visit. They go right to the top. Oh, and, and this is the bit I liked. When Nat and the cop arrive outside the president's office, the way they manage to get their way in and oh, get Christ. an unscheduled meeting is by saying... His wife's been in a car accident, cut her body nearly right in half. I'm not sure they'd be allowed to I know, but he just turned it. Well, the police officer just goes, cuts out the paperwork, doesn't it? Right, come on. Yeah. And the executive goes, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Yeah, morally, is it morally right to use this to arrange an unscheduled meeting? I'm not so well, sure. He never finds out that that's how they got in there. Well, the no. Secretary's the one she, mortified. Oh, yes. They threaten to report the phone company to the media. And he, he says, the president says, if you do this, two dozen people will die every 60 seconds as a, as a result of you reporting this to the media. Yeah. I mean, it sounds quite a good statistic, but saying two dozen. This is the thing. They think they're above the law and they're not, Tony. We learn now that Nat and, by association, Ridley are now targets of the killer. Because I think he gets wind of the fact that they're onto him. So they're now uh, being hunted by the killer as Nat searches Stanley's house and checks his answer machine to work out what happens. So he, he searches Stanley's house, um, finds some evidence and the voice of the killer on Stanley's answer machine that helps him to work out who it is. Yeah, he starts pulling out, because it's all melted in his answer, answer machine, machine, but he starts yeah. wrapping it round very badly, um, something to then put it onto her tape machine to listen to it. And then we have, now we have various scenes of the killer ringing Ridley and her avoiding answering or answering the phone a little bit late as it rings off. So there's this kind of tension where... This is a bit, the camera bit, where it it sort of... Yes, rotates around the the sex phone. Yeah, so the first ring and she gets to it too late and then it starts moving around and she goes to get something to eat. I mean, at first I thought, what the fuck's going on? Um, as a result of that, yeah, we've got this scene where it rotates around the phone, like you say, and eventually it rings. She answers, but it's Nat, and he tells her that he's heard the killer's voice, and they realise that it is Noah Clayton, the tour guide. It was him all along. Well, you get a glimpse of it, because when RT is coming out from work, he makes an appearance with his umbrella... Yes. And sort of chases her to the taxi just to talk to her about some bullshit or whatever. Yeah. I think that's when he realises that they know more well, than Well, to be honest, before sure. I realised it was him, I thought, who's that bloke? He's going to he kill that woman. He very suspicious, yeah. yeah. But they give it away with like a minute later anyway, so it was, you know, not fucking Colombo, is it? At one point, Ridley answers the phone, realises it's Clayton, and says his name down the line, revealing that she knows he's the killer. And before she throws the phone down, yeah. narrowly avoiding getting her brain pierced, her heart exploded. The plan is, this is the plan. Nat and the cops come up with this plan, is to keep Clayton on the line long enough... Trace <laughs> him. ...to trace him, and then redirect the sound and voltage back to the point of origin. Kablam! To kill the fucker! I mean, why would the cops... It's such a bullshit. To well, kill the bastard. Well, it's he, the doctor kind of comes up with that. He says, oh, could you redirect it? So, <laughs> yes. And I knew there was going to be some bullshit. <laughs> Generally, they're saying they might be able to do that to stop him getting killed, the doctor. But I don't it. understand why, because they knew where he lived. Why didn't they just send the police round? Again, they're trying to build up some tension. We switch back to the conference. They introduce him by saying this. A man whose intelligence and intensity is entirely his own. What does that mean? <laughs> I know, there's another bit of something about... And um, it's a reflection of his predecessor, which is Stanley, obviously. Yeah. And I was going, that, that don't make no sense. It, it's, it's like the thrown words at a fucking wall and gone, that'll do. So it's some clever words out of the dictionary. Maybe we don't understand it. Maybe it's too highfalutin. Anyway, Nat is starting his lecture at the conference and then the cops come and interrupt him and tell him that Clayton's called him. So Nat answers the phone to Clayton. So he leaves the conference and answers the phone. He starts getting Clayton to talk and it appears that the phone company stole Clayton's vision. 
fibre optics. I know, I couldn't believe that. That's why he's very, very cross. He goes, fibre optic was my idea. And goes, well, all right then. As a result of that, Nat keeps him talking long enough that they do indeed reverse the voltage down the line. Yeah, but, but not before he's, his phone blows up, though, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, which I couldn't really work out. So he managed to... So he was talking for a bit. They did the usual bit. You've got to keep him on the phone to trace him. But then at a certain point, he has to throw it against the wall that he's got this special room that he's done. Throws it against the wall, blows up, and then they reverse it. Um... But, I mean, the, the plan works. It, it reverses it, it fires and blows up all of Clayton's equipment and then everything collapses on him. Well, no, because this, this is quite a good death scene. Cause, so, yeah, he, he sort of goes, gets up and starts, everything's sparking around him and he looks like he's trying to play, oh, falling over. He trying to, I'm moving around trying to show how... It's very it, animated, this explanation. He's got all his, uh, it's like he's, Fucking, uh, what's it, Rick Wakeman with these keyboards? He's doing all this and loads of sparks and fireworks. controls and dials yeah. and buttons. They're all sparking around him. Again, I'm making it sound a lot better than But then he get, he sort of pushes against like a bookcase full of electronics. Well, he's on the cabinet full of all these controls and... And this is where they obviously blew the budget on FX. Because <laughs> his face goes sort of pink. Oh, yeah. And it jolts him into his cabinet of wires and... Well, all of, basically, all of his shit falls on him, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, they're sort of pushing. Yeah, it sort of falls explosively on him and bounces on his head a bit. And that's really... I mean, there's a scene afterwards oh, where no. Nat goes back to the telephone company. Nat and RT are back at the phone company. He has a conversation with the president of the phone company. And actually, the president of the phone company says... There's nothing you can publish that can be very harmful to us for very long. So again, it's that whole feeling with these big companies that they're above the law. We're not bothered because about this. They've kind of won, and they, I guess it's meant to be kind of a somber ending. Well, but it fucks up right off after well, about two I mean, minutes. <laughs> well, the thing is, for me as well, there is no person you end up siding with because you kind of feel a bit sorry for him because he had this. If you believe it, he had the fiber optics, and that idea was stolen off him. So you kind of feel sorry for him. No, no, no. You don't really feel sorry for the phone company because they're bastards. You hate Nat. The end. However. Jesus Christ. But then it carries on for like a a little sort of flirtatious conversation between them. So he has to go to... Between Nat and RT. So there's a phone call for her and I thought, oh yes, let's do it. Yeah. So I was opening it and going... And she gives him some money. They had a bet earlier in the film. Yeah. Not important, but they had a bet. And yeah. she pays up on the bet. And then he holds the phone up and goes, I've got a call for you. Hilarious. Yeah. Lots of people have died. Blown up. Whatever the three things yes. you fucking he, said. And it then, but then it's an hilarious end bit where he's going, oh, I've got a call for you. That I'm joking about everyone blowing up because they've had a phone call. But then it does sombre music and zooms in on the phone. Like, yeah, it's it has, I wrote um, Chamberlain's stupid grin <laughs> and these last line is, well, actually, I think the last line was, I'll call you, yeah. holding up the phone, what? smiling, and then it freezes on him smiling <laughs> with the phone. <laughs> unless, unless he's gone mad. Hey, you know, I'll well, see you on the flip side or something. Best bit, the credits roll. Um, oh, yeah. Forget, forgettable music plays, and then right at the very end, the phone starts ringing. Ring it, yeah. yeah, best bit. And, the, <laughs> and it's got loads of pictures of phones as well out under the credits. It's, it's, up the, it's definitely in the top 20 of the weirdest endings I've ever seen. Um, and that's bells. Bells. No, no whistles, just bells. You go first. Cause, uh, you know. I'm going to review this. It's not a horror movie. I'm not going to review it. It's unreviewable. The deaths are mildly interesting. No character in it is particularly likeable. I've said this before. He's as unlikable as I think any lead man I can remember. He's just a fucking tool. The scenes that string the deaths together are tedious. The company's covering up the crimes. They get away untouched. The killer you feel mildly sorry for there's no winners uh, it's neither great nor terrible so uh, yeah it's quite forgettable so i won't be going back to it. i didn't think it was that great so i'm giving it three and a half Oof. is yeah, that the lowest well, one you've given yeah it is yeah oh, blimey. because with a lot of the films we've reviewed 
with horror films, and it's not horror film as well, and that's the reason I've kind of it doesn't float I, my I, boat. I, 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 um, it sits squarely in the middle of being quite forgettable and neither brilliant nor shit. So that reason, free enough. I, it frustrated me a bit towards the end because I just thought, fucking hell, who are you? I don't know who you're rooting for in the film. So three and a half. I mean, I ain't getting much more than that. I get more as you can probably tell. But the bit I agree with everything except just because of the weirdness of it, the dialogue being. I, I was listening to the dialogue just because I couldn't quite grasp what the fuck was going on. Because the plot, the, the investigation, all that, you're right, it's just a bit bullshit. But it's like lots, it's, it's, it's a patchwork of different <laughs> films. It's like a TV movie. And there's a point of view bits that are like, fr- meant to be like Friday the 13th because you're meant to see them, but, but you can't see the bloke. So it's meant to be, it's a killer, but then he'll kill him later on, which is... The, the reason I probably like it more than you is because it... I, I've just not seen anything quite like this before. That doesn't make it very good, mind you. <laughs> yeah. And that's about it, really. If they hadn't put the blood on, yeah, could have got away with it. I think, for me, what would it... I mean, what what I class as a horror film and not, I'm not entirely clear. I think what you mentioned to me when we first... Oh, this yeah. film first got suggested, you mentioned... Video cover, yeah. I'm just no, well, get no that. You, you mentioned Scanners... And what I needed was no. a head popping. I needed something because I well, thought the deaths were right. just so lightweight. Are they, oh, yeah, they were I so get. Cheap. Well, I know. The, the, well, put it this way: if you've seen the posters for it, well, the main poster that they I promise sh- a lot. I think the main poster that I sent you, which was a, is a phone, and he's got it against his head, and it's literally blasting pieces of him away. You know, like bits of his him <laughs> falling away. And I think when I saw that in the video shop, you know, on Guild Home Video, uh, I was thinking, oh, that's, that'll be like scanners, but it, it'll be with phones. And that, I remember as a kid looking at it, thinking, one day I'll have a watch of that. And it's only took me about, fucking hell. 35 years. Yeah, at least. I wanted something that explosive. That happened. To be a, few, a few red lines drawn down people's cheeks and a fleck of blood. I'm sorry, it did not deliver. No, I know it wasn't. It wasn't. It's not a gore hand film at all. But um, four and a half. Or into the blade of four and a half. Oh, sorry, I interrupt. I, I wanted somebody to get thrown into the blade of an helicopter. Um, four and a half. Uh, four yes. and a half, which isn't no, it's nowhere near the best score I've ever given. But it's not. <laughs> the, it's not the worst. It's yeah. Awkward. I think um, yeah, it didn't deliver for me. Well, the only time I will revisit Nat Bridger is if he's in his own series. Uh, elderly Richie Chamberlain, environmentalist. Maybe it was a pilot for And it. science teacher, Nat Bridger. The only thing, he was a free thinker, wasn't he? That's it. That's it. Right. <laughs> Tony, I gave you a little bit of homework at the beginning of the episode. I remember, yes. Yes, the top five of your favourite horror movie titles, names, five through to your favourite at once. Horror Hit Parade. Right. In at five. Right. In um, at five. All right. Um, zombie Flesh Eaters. What, do you want me to tell that, right? <laughs> well, it's an, it's an ace. I mean, it's, it's the English version of uh, Zombie. Or Zombie 2, as it's called... Uh, in Italy, I believe, Zombie was uh, Dawn of the Dead. At four. Last House on the left. Just because it's a creepy sounding name. I'm not a particular massive fan of the film, but it's a good sounding name, isn't it? Three. The Exorcist. It's almost a one word title, but it says it all, and you, you have to. Everyone knows what an exorcist is nowadays because of that film, but at the time they wouldn't. What the fuck's that? Sounds a bit scary. Not even in my top five, actually, yeah. Two. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. Even though, well, I won't say the film doesn't deliver, it does, but it, it conjures up much more than you're ever going to freaking see. And also the first title, Crawl, you know, it says the name again and it scares the shit out of you before you even see it. Two, three, one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Halloween. Simple, effective. Just one word time. You know, and it was before, well, there was Black Christmas, alright, before everyone has a paddy. But 
it wasn't the same Christmas Day. It was the first one that had a, I think, I'll probably get this all wrong now, but first one that just had a one word tart that just said, this is a day of the week. And there's something creepy about Halloween as well. Right, do you want my five? Five, three, two, one. Hold on to your hats, you'll like this. Yeah. At number five, Psycho. Effective early example of a time, oh, yeah. title okay. that drew the audience in, and that would have been an early one. You know, people mm. wouldn't have had that before. Yeah. Four, and we've talked about this before, I Spit on Your Grave. It's an exploitative title at its best. Number three, I've got Texas Chainsaw Massacre. A classic name, it evokes an emotion before you've even seen the film, so it's really good. Very good. I wasn't sure whether to go with Zombie Flesh Eaters, because I've got three and two, but they're kind of tied, I think. So, Psycho, I spit on your grave, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Zombie Flesh Eaters, leaves no doubt in your head what that's going to be about, but I'm still going to go for my favourite, Shriek of the Mutilated. Outrageous title. Promise as much, delivers fuck all in the film. Shriek of the Mutilated. You might say it's a bit of a funny novelty title, but I don't think it is. If the film was like a really grim film, like August Underground or Men Behind the Sun, you'd think that that title was pretty grim, to be honest. Yeah, true, yeah, true. So I think it works on loads of levels. Perfect example of where the title true, is true. just used to try and get people in. And it, so that's quite interesting. Five to one, brilliant. Good, Thank you, Tony. Great work. That was the Horror Hit Parade. And hey, everyone. Why don't you give us your suggestions for your favourite horror title? Oh yeah! Good stuff, good feedback, thank you. Right, you're cutting this bit out, aren't you? <laughs> That's it, thank you very much. Alright, yeah, and if you've got any ideas or anything, you know, just say. Does it, if anybody knows who the actor who played Gordon Smith in the film Bells, 1982, if they can let me know, because I'm still sure... I recognised him. The guy in the office block who got thrown out the window. I still I think know. I know who he was. I don't know. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for listening. See you next time. Cheers. Bye.